you hear me okay? I'm getting some notes that pe that I can't be heard. Any thumbs up on hearing? Okay, great, thank you. Okay, so with that, um, all those housekeeping items taken care of, I'd love to introduce the star of our show to you guys, Stephen Kozlowski. He's a wildlife photographer who has been extensively photographing polar bears and their critical habitat areas that have been rapidly affected by climate change. He has braved grueling weather conditions and traveled to remote regions of the Arctic to photograph polar bears and record the intricacies of their delicately balanced ecosystems. A supporter of Alaska Wilderness League, Steve's works have also been published in countless magazines from backpacking to Canadian National Geographic to Time. And with that, I'd love to pass it over to Steve and just watch all of these amazing photographs. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us this evening. And please sit back and enjoy a slideshow on the Alaskan polar bear centraled around the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. Eastern Alaskan Inupiaq legend has it that Nanook the polar bear and Nukaluk the grizzly bear once lived together in an uneasy peace. And Nanook got tired of being pushed around by Ukaluk. So eventually Nanook struck back at Ukaluk, the grizzly bear, and a fight raged, the legend has it, for days. And at the end of the fight, Nanook lost and was forever cast out onto the sea ice where Nanook now, the polar bear, lives. This gives you an idea of the area we're talking about. Up off the coast of Alaska, we can see the polar pack ice. And it's, it's uh, if you can imagine a big turntable, way back when we had turntables, and the ice will pivot and turn. And in the summer, traditionally, it would come close to the coast of Alaska, and it would break off huge pans of ice along the continental shelf area. And we look at this map that shows you the area that I, um, I tried to photograph this project in, which was from Herschel Island in the east over in the Canadian side, all the way to Point Hope, Alaska in the west in the Chukchi Sea. What you can notice about uh, the, the, the east in the coastal plain area is that the continental shelf is extremely close to the shore and only goes about 50 miles offshore before we drop into deep sea waters, which is known as a car. Steve, you meet, you're on mute. Oh, Steve, sorry, can you unmute yourself? Yeah, it muted me. Thank you, sorry. Was, did it just remute me or is it from the beginning? Oh, no, no, just in, for 30 seconds. Okay, and so when we see that that the coastal, the coastal area is right off a shallow continental shelf that drops off into a carbon abyss, and, and it's that coastal area where the continental shelf is that's extremely important. In Chukchi Sea, the continental shelf goes way further out into the, into the ocean. It's not letting me, uh, the clicker's not working. Okay. So one, one way I traveled across the Arctic coast was on a snow machine and I would follow my good buddy, Jack Kayatuck, and he would take me into this environment so I could do this work. And we traveled from Barner Island to uh, Herschel Island and we loaded up all our gear and took off in the evening and Jack travels quite quick and he disappeared. And all I had to follow were the two tracks. So I would just kind of focus on the tracks and try to keep up with them. It was about 20, 30 below zero, 25 mile an hour winds, getting dark. I was starting to feel comfortable. I had my eyes on the track and I was pitched from the snow machine and I, I didn't think to roll. And I was hit by that sled, knocked unconscious, came to a few minutes later. And I saw my snow machine was still running. So I pushed it down. I couldn't move my right arm. I got back on the snow machine and about three or four hours later following that track, I was able to catch up with Jack, who was taking a break at that time. And he explained to me how important it is to roll off the snow off when you fall off the snow machine, how important it is to roll to get away from your sled. So the Arctic is an incredibly hard, dangerous environment to work in and, and you need to learn quickly to, to move around in it. The polar bears themselves can be extremely dangerous. But in this condition, in this case, this polar bear was just curious. It was a mother that was with a cub. She heard the clicking from the camera and wanted to come over and check me out. 
So I backed away. I let her check out that camera. She went back to her cub. I went back to my camera. But you need to have great respect for these animals. These animals know where to travel. This is an example of an image of the 1002 area, which is comes right off the Burks Range, which is in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. And the mother polar bear knows how to travel this area and where to go. To you or I, this area seems to be devoid of life, but it has an incredible amount of, of life coming through it, living in it. One just has to know where to go and when to go. And she has a few years to teach that cub that. And this is their preferred environment, a sure fast environment of, uh, of pack ice that has pans, that has ring seals known as the nutchuck that live on it. These seals continually play cat and mouse with the polar bear and have over 12 breathing holes. And they weigh about 150 pounds and the polar bear is constantly trying to catch them to feed themselves. Another cast of character on, in this environment is the Arctic fox. The mother polar bears themselves will often use play to teach their cubs. In this situation, um, some slush froze the night before and that mother took that cub on that slush and was playing with her. So just like mother people play with their children and teach them through play, polar bears will do the same thing, incredibly intelligent animals. This is an example of, the lead, of a lead off of Cape Lisburn, which is in the Northwest corner of the North American continent. There, the leads are quite close to shore due to the high winds and currents that are close to shore. And it's the lead system through the Arctic that allows life to travel through it. And this is an oasis in a desert, this lead system. And in springtime, if you can think of the lead system that goes all the way into Canada throughout the whole Arctic as a lung that opens and closes, and it allows this amazing multi-species migration to travel through it. And this is, this is a picture of off of a lead seven miles off of Ukiavik, which was formerly known as Barrow, Alaska during spring whaling season. Part of the multi-species migration that comes through are hundreds of thousands of birds. This is an example of eider ducks. We have tens of thousands of beluga whales that travel through. We have bowhead whales that travel through. We have pigeon guillemots that even can spend the winter up in these open leads. We have waris cows and calves that will come through in the summer on the ice flow into the, into the feeding grounds. This is a bearded seal. Its skins are still used for umiaks, where the spring whalers will go out and hunt whales, which they've been doing for tens of thousands of years. They weigh up to 750 pounds, and uh, they feed the people up in that country and the polar bear. There's many different species of fish in the web of life. We have many different varieties of vertebrates all the way down to krill, to zooplankton, and to the carbon matter that enters, that enters the water column through the ice along the continental shelf and allows for this amazing web of life to exist in, in this area all along the Alaskan Arctic coast. And of course, we can't speak of the Alaskan Arctic without speaking of the Inupiaq people that live up there. This is my buddy, Melvin Jack Kayatuk. And without his help, I would not have learned how to get around and been able to create a lot of the images and the stories. It's his help and the help of other local people that I met over the last 20 years, 25 years that I've been able to create this work. This is a friend, Mike Dirks from Point Hope, Alaska, known as Tikiak, Alaska, which is the oldest continued settlement in North America. He, he goes out all the time hunting. And in this case, he hunted a seal. He'll take that skin and he'll turn it into small Anupiaq dolls and he'll sell them. And then he'll use the meat and the blubber to feed his family and the dogs. This woman in Kotzebue was catching she fish and I wanted to photograph her and she wanted me to help her fish. And she was stacking fish, pile after pile of fish up. And I was wondering, what are you going to do with all this fish? And uh, she explained to me how she was going to get it out to all the surrounding villages and to all the elders that were in the, in the villages and in Kotzebue and in the different communities. And the, the people up there really, they value their elders still. It's something we, we seem to be losing in our society. And they cherish their elders. They take care of their elders. They feed their elders. And they get knowledge and wisdom from their elders. 
This is the Lugatuck celebration, the celebration of a spring whale hunt and, and a successful spring hunt where all the people come together. And this is a blanket toss, but the point of them coming together is to celebrate and share and the community and the hunters uh, share the food with the entire community and everybody walks away with big bags of food. They're also proud of their own, as much as they're proud of their own culture, they're also proud to be US citizens. And this is an example in Tikiak, Point Hope, Alaska, the 4th of July parade, where they have a parade and a competition every year and people decorate their vehicles and their four wheelers. This is a traditional home in the Eastern Alaskan Arctic and the Herschel River, the Herschel River Delta area where they had wood due to the fact that wood would push out into the rivers and, uh, and they would build them. Jack's family would live in these homes and this is a home on the backside of Herschel Island. They would even have wood chimneys. And when you get to the Western Arctic coast of Alaska, they would use rocks and sod and whale bones. And this home was lived into 1972 and notice the two nails on the whale bone out front. Somebody had a phone line hooked up, up to it, I was told. They were quite warm and comfortable homes to live in. This gives you an idea of how the, the polar pack ice is melting. In 2007, it was our second greatest loss and it can show you, it shows you that red line where the traditional ice flows used to stay all summer. And then they would broke, break off and they would have huge pans of ice along the coast of Alaska, releasing carbon and, and, uh, and oxygen into the water supply and starting the whole web of life all the way up to the new back hunters and the polar bears. This gives you an idea of the average 2005 and 2007. And this shows you what it was like in 2012, which was the big, the greatest loss of sea ice. But it's not all doom and gloom. Nothing goes in a straight line. So in uh, 2020, uh, 21, we see that the sea ice came back to a level of traditional norms as far as its average extent. This image was taken in uh, Cape Thompson, just south of uh, Point Thompson, just south of uh, Tikiak, Point Hope. The interesting thing about this image, it was taken the end of February and the entire Chukchi Sea, a large portion of it was wide open. So speaking to elders in the village, they hadn't seen that before. And something you understand with climate change is that these anomalies are popping up in the Arctic more and more, different anomalies, where we traditionally had huge pack ice along the coast, pans of ice floating around that we had this amazing web of life exist on. We don't see that every summer as often anymore. But when you travel through open water, you don't really see much. And then when you get into this multi-year ice or you get into ice, all of a sudden you start seeing fish in the water, you see seals, you might hear fox barking on the ice flows, you'll see a polar bear run across, and you understand that it's this ice environment over the continental shelf that makes for this amazing web of life that exists up there. So what does the polar bear do when this coastal ice melts? It has two options. It either goes, goes with the polar pack ice offshore, in which case it ends up in an environment that's, that, that's believed to be low in nutrients because of the depth of the water, or it moves to shore where it has to wait for the ice to come back in. And it can possibly get any, you know, if, if uh, if orca whales were to kill a bowhead and the bowhead was to wash up, if hunters was, were to leave something behind, if an animal died, they might be able to find something to survive off of until the, the polar pack ice comes back in. So now in August, where we used to see ice flows, we traditionally don't see the ice flows. And this is a picture taken late night in, uh, in the middle of August off of the 1002 area of, uh, of no ice. We also see the coastlines are starting to melt more, these beautiful flower gardens and no ice protecting the shoreline. If we get a heavy windstorm that can blow up on the shore, we see chunks of island breaking off along the 1002 coastal plain into the Arctic Ocean that we didn't see before not too long ago. So we can see towns like Ukiavik, formerly known as Barrow, Alaska, which are quite low to sea level. You take away that ice, you put it in a big windstorm, um, it, it raised sea level a couple of feet or a couple, not even a couple of feet, they have to move further inshore. 
So wanting to photograph the entire Arctic coast and the polar bear, I wanted to photograph different aspects of the lifestyle of the polar bear. So I asked Jack if we could possibly find a den a long time ago. And he said, sure, you know, we can give it a shot. He thought he might know some areas. So we headed to, um, to the, the Canning River along the eastern edges of the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. We waited for Camden Bay to free, freeze. And then he told me, go as quick as you can. Don't go behind me, go next to me and don't stop. Of course, not really understanding things at that time. I really didn't think much of it, except I would look down and see the ice was kind of wet. So we went full blast, got to the other side, and then I understood why we needed to go fast. The ice wasn't really thick yet at that point. But right away, we found uh, what appeared to be a misdigging of a polar bear again, but no polar bear. So we, we thought we'd look a little further in and, uh, and a little further up the river, we, in a kook, we found, uh, found a den that probably from the same bear, she had decided to find the right spot and went in and made a den. So the mothers are, uh, they have delayed implantation. They'll get pregnant in the spring and then they'll go through their summer season. And at the end of their, um, end of the summer season into fall, into November, December, they'll find a suitable area. And if everything's right, they'll go into a one month pregnancy and they'll have up to one to four cubs. I've only seen one to three ever as, as far as polar bears go, but they'll, they'll have, after that one month pregnancy, they'll have a one to three cubs, a pound and a pound and a half a piece. They'll have no fur, their eyes will be closed, and they'll be 100% dependent on the mother at that point in time. So we decided to go back that following uh, spring or end of winter, at the end of February, beginning of March, in some really harsh conditions to try to see if that polar bear even stayed there. We had, we had no idea. So myself, Jack, and our buddy Bruce um, headed back over towards the Canning River and set up camp. And, uh, and Bruce showed us how his grandmother way back when taught him how to build an igloo from the Canadian Arctic. And we built an igloo as a blind and we kept our camp further back. And then we, um, and then we waited there. But while we waited, Jack went back to town to get supplies and he didn't come back and we didn't think much of it. And it turned out a snow machine had broken down because the conditions were so cold the, uh, where the weld was to his oil pan, it broke, all his oil drained out and his, his engine seized up. So he had to walk two days home into a 25 mile an hour wind at approximately 20 below zero. And he was able to get home. Right after he got home, we got hit with a 60 plus mile an hour windstorm at 40 below. And, uh, and luckily he was able to get home. We were, we were at camp um, doing everything we could just to keep our tent upright at that point in time. But the Arctic's an amazing place. It's really a heaven and hell kind of place. And as quick as it went from being hell, it became heaven one following morning. We woke up, there was no wind. You could see all the way across the coastal plain, all the way to the Brooks Range. I mean, you could see, you felt like you could see forever. And, uh, and it felt like a completely different place than the day before. So now we wondered, is there really a polar bear there? We've been here for weeks and weeks and weeks. And we looked up on the hill and we saw there was a little break in the ice uh, hole. So at that point we figured there good chance there's a bear there um, letting cold air in to let the, uh, let the cubs get used to it before she takes them out. So we, we waited every day in our igloo and I uh, just wondered if we'd get a chance to capture some images. One night, my uh, 500 millimeter manual lens got fogged up and I was trying to get the moisture out the following morning. And we ran out of heat in our tent. So I had to use a little cook stove and I got the glass element too hot and it cracked. Luckily it didn't shatter, it just cracked. So I was able to photograph through it. Then eventually one nice, nice morning, um, the, the the, the, the wind was right coming off the north, and, uh, and before you knew it, um, she stuck her head out. And that snow was completely brown the day before because that windstorm had blown dirty dirt all over it. But that night, the, uh, the ice fog gripped to it and gave it the appearance of being white snow, which allowed for great pictures. Now, polar bears are matrilineal, so you'll find many dens in one area. And this coastal area is extremely important 
to, uh, to the polar bears denning sites, the 1002 coastal area. This is an uninterrupted area with no industrial development right now. And the polar bear can den there quietly and safely. Traditionally, this was always a denning site, but then there was a call by Westerners to have polar bears in zoos. So Anupiax uh, prior to 1950 would, would find a polar bear den with dogs, I was told. They would go in and they would catch the cubs and then they would give the cubs to a child in the family, usually who would raise them until the fall. And then the whalers would purchase the cubs, bring them to San Francisco. And then these, uh, these animals were dispersed across the country. And that's how we got our original stock into zoos. Well, this ended in the late forties, early fifties, I believe. And slowly these denning sites came back and maybe with the offshore ice being more unstable, these denning sites have even become more important and more and more used these days. So coastal denning sites are extremely important um, in the future to the survival of the polar bear possibly. But anyway, if you've ever seen little piglets, you know how quick they move to and fro. And these, these little bear cubs were exactly like that. And the whole time the mom has to be vigilant to, to make sure no wolves or wolverines or grizzly bears or other polar bears comes along and gets a hot meal. And she would constantly talk to them and coo to them and keep an eye on them and walk them around. They would constantly play and wander off, but they feed off of her extremely rich milk and, uh, and grow quite fast. They're about 15 to 20 pounds at this point in time when they come out of the den and it correlates with the, uh, the ring seal pupping that's going on along the Arctic coast. Eventually she smelt the north wind. She one day ate some grass, I imagine to get her digestive system going. And then she headed out into this, uh, this shore fast sea ice environment, to hunt those ring seal pups. So we thought we'd take a look in her den um, and, uh, and we went inside it and we checked it out and it was a multi-chamber den. And as the snow drift changed over time, she would move her den up the snow drift. And then if you've ever been in a snow cave, you know how, uh, how comfortable it can be for a while, but then eventually the walls are iced up from all the moisture. So the way she dealt with this is she would continually scrape the ice off the walls so they could be nice and comfortable and warm inside there. And this was just another den we found, found close by. Again, them being matrilineal, they're never you know, too far apart. In one area of five or six miles, I think we bumped into three or four dens. We just took this picture and took off. We didn't want to disturb these animals. And then the polar bear needs these huge expanses of open wilderness where it can listen and hunt and try to catch seals, sit outside seal holes for days at a time to get that one time chance to use its perfectly designed body to, to stick it in the hole and grab that 150 pound nut chuck and pull it out of that hole and get a meal. And I wondered again about the Arctic fox and the relationship. Is the fox just a moocher off the polar bear? And I was out with some Inupiaq hunters on the ice and they saw a polar bear track and they wanted to hunt that polar bear. And as they tried to find that polar bear, we started to hear a fox barking and we didn't see the polar bear. And as we started to head back in, they saw a large polar bear taking off on some rough ice and they assumed at that point that that fox had warned that polar bear there was danger and may, maybe it saved that polar bear's life. So the, the polar bear will hunt the seal, try to eat the blubber, most likely leave the meat behind if it's not hungry, the fox will get the meat and then the polar bear gets an extra set of eyes and ears. And it's not too far fetched to think these animals, certain pairs of these animals might have relationships that go beyond a season. Now the illusion of the dark cloud is the, uh, the signification of open water off the Arctic coast. And the open, open water is where life is. So if you're out on the ice looking for open water, you'll look to the sky for the mirror image of the open water. And then if you can get to the open water, this is where you'll see the life. Polar bears walking along the edge, swimming through the lead, trying to swim up to seals. And when seals are in the open water, it's a lot more difficult for them to catch. Once when I was out with Jack and his wife, Alice, 
we saw a ring seal, actually a young one, swim up to a polar bear, which was bizarre. And, uh, and I think the polar bear thought it was bizarre too, because it took a minute for the polar bear to figure out what was going on. And just in that split second, that young seal took off and got away. They'll also hunt beluga whales, give them the opportunity. So if a beluga whale is closed in a certain area, a polar bear will, um, will continually rip out its breathing hole and bleed it out and bring it up on the ice. These animals are perfectly designed for this environment. They have black skin that allows them to absorb heat. They have hollow colorless fur, which is an amazing insulin, and they can effortlessly flow across these, these ice flows like this one is doing right here. They have more trouble overheating than being cold. So they'll often lay down or get in the water to cool down. One, one aspect of the polar bear's life is, is, uh, is, is wanting to spend more, one aspect of my time up in the Arctic is wanting to spend more time in the polar bear's environment. So to do that, I was able to go, uh, I was able, I was kind enough by the Hops and One Whale crew to join them several seasons out on the ice during spring whaling. And way back when, when I first did it, I was lucky enough to see some multi-year ice that was still around landing up on the coast. But it's something that's gone on for tens of thousands of years and the Nupiak hunters and family groups break trail and make a road out to that dark cloud to where all the life is and bring all their equipment on the shore fast ice where it's safe. And then when conditions allow, they probe out on their trail that was made over weeks to the edge of the ice, which can be miles and miles offshore. If you go back before the seventies, I hear stories of leads being 20, 30 miles offshore. And now, you know, you find them a lot closer to shore, three, four, five, six, seven miles from shore. But they watch and listen to the conditions because you continually have to be careful that you don't break off on the ice you're on and float away. And they set up camp and then the waiting game starts. And this is Captain Chucky Hobson under a full moon, enjoying the beauty of his, uh, his country and waiting for the whales. That's an umiak skin boat made out of bearded seal skins. And then the animals come and that multi, multi species migration happens as that giant lung of the lead system opens and closes. And you go from seeing nothing to having hundreds or thousands of ducks fly by you. And then you wait, the polar bear waits, Everybody who goes to the Arctic waits and everybody who lives in the Arctic waits, the animals and the people alike. And you do all kinds of things. This was a friend, friend of mine, Harvard, and he was building statues and just waiting, waiting for the whales. And this is Price Brow wearing polar bear mitten, mittens, the warmest mittens I've ever put on in my life. And he's uh, evaluating seed conditions. And then sometimes the hunters will actually open holes in the ice to try to attract animals, seals and whales. And uh, the polar bear do the same thing. So it's often wondered, did the new back hunter learn from the polar bear, how to hunt on the ice? And I mean, there's some old stories about that. And then when that lead system that long opens, the hunters will strike back out into the ice. They'll listen for the whales. And then the whales will start moving by. And then a whale will get close enough and a harpoon will be striked. And then a whale will eventually be caught, caught and the crews will come together to pull the animal out of the ocean to share with the community. This whale had a Yankee harpoon tip in it from 1878. So they were able to, to tell it was at least that old. They also can cut their eyes and, uh, and count them as rings to, to, to tell their age. And I believe these animals can get over 200 years old. When the Western whalers came and the Western commercial hunters came, they not only spread disease and decimated wildlife populations, but they, uh, they, they almost just completely destroyed the, the food source for the people. But the whale is eventually pulled out and, uh, and eventually it's butchered. Sometimes it takes days to butcher the whale. And then the people go back to their separate crews and then the animals show up to feed on whatever's left over. This is an ivory bill gull and polar bears will come along the shore fast ice. They'll swim across the leads 
And this is an image of a polar bear carcass on the eastern Alaskan Arctic where the hunters hunt in the fall. And they've, uh, they've left the, the remains behind for the bears. And this has been a unique relationship for those bears where while they're waiting for the sea ice to come in, they can feast on what the hunters don't need and what's left over from the hunt and they can fatten up. And it's a, it's a really special relationship they have with the bears up there. So wanting to do this project, I also wanted to photograph from the air to give people a perspective so they could understand how a cub uses a mother to swim from flow to flow. And if you take away that ice and the, the cub has to swim hundreds of miles in a, in a storm, that you can understand how they, they can drown at sea. You could see what multi-year ice looks like with a polar bear and a cub traveling across it and how seals use it to access their feeding grounds and rest during the summer. And this is an image of a bearded seal. And whales use it and use the holes in the ice to breed and feed under the ice. And this is an image of war walrus traveling um, off of the National Petroleum Reserves that use pans of ice as basically floating houseboats. So when you take away that chore fast ice, they don't have the ability to, to the, the cat, the ability to float around and, uh, and they're forced to go to haul outs on the shore. And these haul outs tend to be very big and we see issues of, of waruses getting trampled. And we also see issues of overfeeding in certain locations. So the polar bear still travels this environment and the bearded seal still travels this environment. This is an image taken off a of demarcation bay along the Canadian border off of the 1002 refuge where the mountains literally come right down to the ocean. It's a highly dynamic area with lots of wildlife and lots of animals. Um, this ice was quite thin that year. I took this picture and within a couple of weeks it turned over and melted. And the polar bear that's so perfectly adapted for this multi-year ice that can literally climb straight up it and be king of this environment is finding itself more and more tossed into open water where it's having to make a break for the polar pack ice or for the, the, coastal, the coastal area of Alaska and the 1002 coastal plain of the refuge. We, we've seen skinny polar bears and polar bears get old and get skinny and die, but one wonders, are we seeing more of these things than we've seen in the past? Um, we see polar bears in villages. Is, you know, it sounds like that goes on more now than prior to the 70s. Um, we see them along the barrier islands, along the Arctic coast, more than traditionally. Um, this has allowed myself, along with my, uh, my buddy Jack and Bruce, to spend thousands of hours watching and learning about them. And traditionally, biology was done by just sitting, watching, and learning. And some of the things we learned is these animals are incredibly social. These are two large males, and they seem to be together for no more reason than the joy of being together. And these are four large males. They're incredibly hard to get near. They're very shy. And, uh, and they're just, they're just, they're amazing creatures. A way to tell you have a large male, as you can see to the one to the right, you have a small head and a large body. The necks on males are, uh, are thicker than the, the, the heads where the females have a, a thicker face than they do a neck. And we see these same barrier islands shared with sows and cubs. And the cubs are the ones that are curious and constantly trying to come over and check you out. This is an image that shows sows, cubs, boars, all sharing the same area. And this is an example of one feeding off the, off the kill of a bowhead whale. So nothing goes to waste in the Arctic. I mean, it all gets eaten by animals, by the people. And this is when the polar bear comes back into contact with its old nemesis, Ukaluk the grizzly bear. And it's at this point in time that, uh, that they're, they're a little standoffish because Ukaluk the grizzly bear is a lot more, if you know a North Slope grizzly bear, they're just crazy, they're hardwired. And uh, one time at night, I was watching polar bears on a, a whale carcass eat. And I was just sitting there watching and all of a sudden they all got up and took off. And it turned out some grizzly bears were coming. And the grizzly bears came and took over the whale carcass and those polar bears took off. And then about 15, 20 minutes later, those polar bears came back with the biggest polar bear I ever saw in my life, a huge male. 
And those grizzly bears got wind of that polar bear and saw that polar bear and they all took off then. So it was pretty interesting to see. He was a massive polar bear. He didn't even look like one, he was so big. This is an image that, uh, that possibly is a, is a hybrid. There's no DNA for it, so there's no way to know. There's a lot of talk about climate change and more hybrids now than in the past. Um, that's possible, but I hear stories that go back way, way to places like the Smoking Hills in Canada, where the mountains come right down to the sea. And in the springtime, when you have the seals pup, you have, you have wolverines, grizzly bears, wolves all go out into the ice with the polar bear to hunt seal pup. So it's possible that the right polar bear and right grizzly bear meet up, they get together and they mate. So it, it'd be interesting to know if this is going on more now with climate change being there's possibly more interaction with these animals. Um, you do have to be careful around them. This is a sow trying to trace a boar off a whale carcass so they can get very aggressive. You have to respect them. Uh, the cubs sometimes will snap out at the mom just like children do with their mothers. And often the, uh, the sows will just put the cubs back in their place like mothers do with children. And then all is forgiven and they go back to enjoying each other's company and playing and, uh, and being together. And it's because of this relationship along the eastern Alaskan Arctic coast with the hunters and the bears that they're able to get some extra nutrition and food and, uh, and, and wait for that ice and, and do it comfortably. As soon as that ice comes, these animals are incredibly interested and excited to get back in it. And they're, they're in it before they can stand on it. And as soon as they can stand on it, they're on it. And this, this is a polar bear that's distributing her weight because sea ice has salt, since it has salt in it, it's pliable and it bends and it, it, they get on it when it's in a few inches and you can see she's spreading her weight out in many different ways. The cubs are constantly wanting to play. And in this case, they used a sig seagull as a play toy. Even large females will come back and greet each other and play. I mean, it's, it's we think of these animals as almost being like a clan where they separate, they go out onto the land and then they come back together and they enjoy each other's company like, like the people did traditionally in this area. The cubs are constantly coming over and they're, they're curious in this situation, this was a long time ago, I was photographing this cub and it was playing tag with its sibling. And for a minute I lost track of the sibling and the sibling was trying to sneak up behind me and get me to join in the game of tag. So, I mean, you have to be aware and conscious and give them their space and, and back away and let them have plenty of room. These are two animals talking, making expressions to each other. So they do have vocalizations, they have expressions in a language. To show you how they are, these sows where their cubs are playing, took frozen whale meat, broke holes in the ice, put the frozen whale meat in the water, let it thaw out, and then they proceeded to take it out and eat it after that. Um, during times of, of storms, it's really good to give them their space when they lose their ability to see, smell, and hear. Of course, uh, like anything, they're gonna be more on edge to their surroundings. So I, 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 you know, I really hope as time goes on and we, we find possible engineering solutions or solutions to climate change globally through the relationship of the people that live in the Alaskan Arctic and the polar bear, they have an ability to, to stay there. And through the protection of the 1002 coastal area by the Alaska Wilderness League, Braided River Books and the Campion Foundation, we can still have polar bears until these solutions come about and these animals can learn to adapt and we don't lose this amazing animal from our, uh, from our country. It's a very, very special gift we have. A very, a a it's a treasure, it's a national treasure. Eventually these animals smell the north wind. Some of them say goodbye to some friends and they slip away into the Arctic and they truly are once again, ghosts of the Arctic at that point in time. And this is an image I made with my buddy, Melvin Jack Kayatuk and our fish and wildlife um, federal take permit a while ago along a barrier island, the 1002 coastal plain of a, of a semi young adult polar bear 
that we possibly knew when, when it was a cub that was an incredibly gentle animal. And we were able to make this image and show the importance of the barrier island, the importance of the work that Alaska Wilderness League does, that Braided River Books do, that the Campion Foundation supports, the, the love the Inupiaq people have for their animals in their country that, that can hopefully give us hope and find solutions to save these places and to save these animals and, and move the world in a positive direction. Um, and again, here's an image of my friend, my buddy Jack, I've been working with for the last 20 plus years, and I hope to be able to continue that work. And uh, I thank everybody for joining us, and, uh, and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you so much, Steve. Um, yeah, I'll, uh, there we go. We have you on the full screen now. Um, before we start with the Q&A, I just wanted to sh um, re reiterate some of Steve's points that we are doing things to help protect polar bears and their habitat at Alaska Wilderness League. And um, thank you so much to all of you for being here because um, just recently in the last week, there was a new public comment period that was released that will impact a new drilling plan called the Willow Drilling Plan, and it's in the Western Arctic. And this drilling plan has the potential to release so much carbon dioxide and really make climate change worse for the polar bears and for all of us. And so we will be sending out alerts um, coming out in the next week so that everyone can submit an official public comment to urge the Biden administration to reject this plan. Um, polar bears also live in the Western Arctic where um, some of this drilling can take place. So it's not only the impact of climate change, but also the landscapes around where the drilling takes place are at risk from drilling. So we will share those uh, links with you as soon as we have our action alert up and ready to go. Um, and the next thing that you guys can do to help protect polar bears and the habitats that they live in is to donate to Alaska Wilderness League. Uh, right now is kind of a special time because we have a matching grant so that if anyone becomes a monthly donor, your first six monthly gifts will be matched um, dollar for dollar. So I encourage you to become a monthly donor and help support the day in and day out work that we do to protect all these habitats that sustain animals like polar bears. Um, and that's all with regarding uh, helping. And now um, I'm hoping that we can get to some Q&A. So I'm just going to quickly look at some of the questions that um, have come up. And um, one of the things actually, Steve, I was my first question, I'm just going to ask as I look through was, what did you do to tell the bear you're not actually going to play tag? <laughs> when oh, I just I just left the area quickly. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so let's see. Um, okay. <clears throat> Um, so one of the, oh, so one of the first questions is wondering around how you protect your camera during the close-up shots when you're getting so close to the animals. How, how do you stay safe and keep your gear safe? I, you know, when you're with animals, if you spend enough time with them, you can learn to read them and understand, you know, get a good feel for whether you're in a safe situation or not. As far as camera gear goes, I've destroyed a lot of it. And I, I imagine I'll, you know, keep destroying it. It just kind of how it, it's par for the course. So, um, yeah. yeah. Um, and then another person was asking about polar bear viewing in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. Um, apparently, or th they were wondering if polar bear viewing permits could possibly happen there and oh, I don't I don't believe that will happen this year no I believe there's a lot of things to be sorted yet so that's uh that the good news is the uh the, you know the remains from the whale bones are feeding the bears and that's really what's important the bears and the relationship with the hunters is still intact and um and that's uh, still occurring to this day so that's special and that's important to those animals and to their future yeah I would just like to flag somebody has their hand raised. Can you? Oh, yeah. Yeah, sure. If you would, if you have a question, um, let's see. I wonder if there's a way for me to hand raised. 
Um, well, but while I figure out the if we can unmute people to oh, um, to ask a oh there did, are you unmuted? Hi. Yes, I am. Thank you. Okay. Oh, great presentation. Thank you so much. I I just you're welcome. I just have, I just uh, our whole family watched it. I just I just um typed my question into the chat anyway, but I heard in a different presentation that some some parties, some people are considering moving the polar bears to Antarctica in the future. And um, that seemed sort of drastic to me. I'm I'm just a layperson, I just care about nature and about keeping uh, you know, or keeping the animals where they they belong anyway have you heard about that kind of plan and what do you think about it thank you to bring polar bears to antarctica yes just just uh, to, to ensure their survival to to transport them to antarctica and assume they can feed on the penguins this is what it, that naturalist said oh, yeah there was actually someone who tried to do that in the 18 i forget the exact year and luckily he was stopped because um, that would have been devastating to Antarctica for you know the ecosystem that exists there. So I don't believe that'll ever happen. No, that, that would be a definite no. Okay, because this was like in a presentation last year that I heard. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I, I think uh, there's a lot of um, global rules around what goes on in Antarctica. And I, I, I don't believe that that would ever be permitted, I don't think, yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, thanks for Great. watching. Um, another question is, what's the status of the the base of the Arctic Food Pyramid, and kind of how how is that going in terms of climate change and the impacts to the smaller creatures like the phytoplankton and the zooplankton? Now, my understanding at this point in time, things are still intact. I mean, as you saw that. Uh, that 2021 ice map, you know, we had more average conditions. So, I mean, as as much as things are changing, you know, they're, they're still there's still an ebb and flow. So it's uh, my understanding is things are still fairly intact. The Beaufort Sea Bear is under more pressure due to the fact that the continental shelf is a lot closer to shore. Uh, I remember not too many years ago, I heard um, scientific numbers believing that they might have been half, but the bears we see in the 1002 coastal area tend to be extremely healthy and look really well. So, I mean, there's a lot of positivity for their future and their, uh, their denning locations. Awesome. Um, so another question about sort of bear safety. Um, someone wanted to know how close a mother bear will let you get to herself and her cubs and kind of, could you just talk more about maybe differences between how you can interact with bears when they have cubs versus not? So, um, so first of all, I was able to obtain, uh, myself along with Jack, we were able to turn, obtain a federal fish and wildlife take permit so we could legally get close to these animals along the Arctic coast. Um, un under the federal mandates. And then once that was obtained, um, we needed to, to you know, you, it's just like people, you know, some people you don't want to get close to. Um, so you have to, you know, weigh the situation, you have to wait and watch and you, you don't rush into these things and, um, and you move extremely slow and respectfully. And uh, d when done with that with people or animals, it can be done, you know, it can be done well. So each, each situation is very different. Could you explain a little bit more about the how it works to get or the why you would need to get requirement to get closer to the polar bears? Why I would need to get to or anyone would to take pictures of the polar bears. So for for me, I'm trying to in, in I'm trying to create two dimensional images that educationally can give the feeling to somebody that they're there without having to be there. So, you know, they can, they can get a sense for what these animals are and how incredible they are. And, uh, and, and you know, and that's, that's what I've gone about. Now, that was something that was done more so in the past for me than the present as time goes on. Um, you know, I think I've accomplished a lot of those images and a lot of my images now are quite a bit further away. Um, but again, if anybody wants to embark on that, they need to follow all federal mandates and, and permits that are required to do that to start with. 
before they before they continue past that point. Thank you. Um, someone wanted to know how many individuals you have been able to follow over time, if any. I, I think you alluded to at least one. That's a good question. Um, you know, uh, it's really hard to tell them apart one year to another, but an interesting story is uh, we watched a, a female that had a broken leg and she showed up, I believe it was in 2009, with a uh, very skinny, with, a, with her back leg hanging. And we thought, no way this bear is going to survive. And she was, a, she was a really mellow bear. And then she came back the following year with, uh, with cubs. And then one year after she raised those cubs, she came back with triplets. And then another year she came back with, uh, with another set of cubs. And that whole time she still had a broken leg. It never really healed. And it was a back leg. So it was used as a rudder when she swam. So it probably worked out OK for her. Um, and she and she's a bear that we knew and her cubs. So, I, I mean, I really, to be honest, I don't have an answer for that question, but it could be 50, 100 different bears year after year. Um, it, it just uh, really hard to tell them apart over the years. Oh, that's amazing. Um, another person asked, where did that question go? Um, Oh, the other person asked if there was more information about why they why people think that the ice came back more recently and if it had to do with some of the world shutting down due to COVID and not impacting climate or of just it was one of these random differences in years. Well, I mean, nothing moves in a straight line. So you know, we're still losing multi-year ice. And, uh, and you know, maybe one year we have more, maybe one year we have less. Um, I don't have a specific answer for that other than, you know, nothing moves in a straight line. It, it often, you know, ebbs and flows, continually moving forward, you know, in that, in that direction. And related again to the individual animals, um, a great question was, how methods do you use to keep track of or to notice the different animals like what how, how do you tell them apart is it a whisker pattern or what what sorts of things do you notice well in, in the case of the the mother with the broken leg we you know we always saw that broken leg every year so that was a, a no-brainer but in in a lot of other cases it's just you know just that these animals are comfortable. I've been to other areas of the world to photograph polar bears and, you know, their interaction is a lot different too. If they're not used to people or haven't been around you, um, it just, it just really depends. But, um, but there's not a lot of ways to, to tell them apart in a lot of cases, unless they have a specific marking that allows you to separate them out year in from year out. Do you see a lot of polar bears with the tracking collars on them? Oh, we see some tracking collars. I, I believe Fish and Wildlife isn't doing that so much anymore. Um, you could refer to them for more information on that, um, but we have seen that in the past and they have collected quite a bit of information from that. I believe both on the Canadian side and the US side, but, uh, but you could go to USGS and find out more about that from them. Is there a strong difference that you notice between viewing polar bears in um, Alaska versus in Canada, if you have done that? Um, well, Svalbard is another place I've viewed polar bears separate from Alaska. And, um, and I, I didn't notice huge differences other than the, the polar bears in the 1002 area and the Barter Island area because of their, their extremely important relationship with the hunters seem to be extremely healthy compared to other bears I've seen out on the ice. Um, so that's that's one thing I noticed over time. Someone asked if you've observed cultural changes in the villages. And I want to add on the question of, um, and maybe especially with regard to attitudes towards polar bears. Oh, well, I mean, the Inupiaqs and polar bears have a, 
a history of tens of thousands of years. I mean, they have a deep respect and understanding of each other. And, uh, and, and as far as changes in the villages, I mean, there's more erosion than there, there has been in the past, but really historically, you know, my time of 20, 25 years there in a human's life is quite long, but in historical per periods isn't even a drop of a drop of a drop of a drop in a bucket. So, um, yeah. Okay. Um, I think that I'm coming to the end of the questions. Um, yeah, so if anyone has additional questions that they'd like to ask Steve, there are a number of um, ways that you guys can find out more. Um, you can email us. We'll also include links to this presentation in, um, in the email that we send out tomorrow. But I also, as Lois has said in the chat, um, I encourage you to check out Steve's website, which is lefteypro.com. Um, you could peruse his prints. There are so many amazing ones. And um, also check out his books. All of those are possible ways to get more information about polar bears and his work. And we will share all of that with you guys in our email. So with, um, unless there are any other last questions, we're so happy to have you guys with us tonight. Um, thank you so much. And we will be having another Geography of Hope episode in March, actually too. Um, it will, the first one will be with um, George Devoki and it is on the Birds of Cooper Island and it's a members only event. And we'll be sending out more information about that. And you can of course become a member at any time to join. So thanks everyone, have a great evening. And thank you again, Steve. Thanks for having me, Hillary. Yeah. You are so welcome. Thank you. All right, bye everyone.